What a prayer. Thank you, young people. Great job tonight. I know that's the hunger of so many hearts, just to see the Holy Spirit to descend upon us. Hallelujah. I was just thinking as they sang of some services I could think about where the Holy Spirit just suddenly fell. Just, amen. I mean, you don't see it so much back east, but back west, I guess, where the expanses are more open, you can see the rain coming. I mean, just raining hard in here. Wouldn't you like to see rain coming tonight? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're going to go ahead and, and pray before the uh, preaching or teaching of the Word tonight. We want to continue to remember Brother Heath's father in prayer in a very terminal situation. Remember him and the family. Remember Brother, or excuse me, Sister Deb Rose's father, Brother Gibbs, uh, Buddy's uh, father, Elaine Cope's mother. We just have a, a, a lot of these needs. Continue to remember uh, Deborah Lewis and Matthew, that God would touch them and help them. Amen. Do you have a need to add to these tonight before we... Yes. 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 Yes, a third grade student whose mother passed away. Yes. An unspoken request. Yes. 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 Who who was this? I'm sorry. David's uncle. David's uncle. Okay. Let's remember these needs tonight. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, let's continue to remember uh, April Spiri in prayer, and she is improving, but just needs a continual touch, yes. Yeah, remember Alexander and his breathing stuff. Yes. Sisters, children, and niece. Anybody else? Any young people tonight? All right. Yes. Chase and his family. Continue to remember Bentley in prayer. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's remember Carl tonight. Yes. Praise the Lord. It was Jesus that said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. We can do everything else when we gather together, but we haven't prayed. We haven't really come for what the purpose of the house is. So let's stand tonight and let's join our hearts together in a concert of prayer. Would you all just pray out loud together and ask the Lord to move. Father, we need you. We're a needy people, Father. We've got to have your help, Lord. And Lord, these needs are important to those that requested them. God, there's hearts that are heavy. Hearts, Lord, facing death and sickness. Lord, they don't have to walk that road alone. God, you're with them. And I pray, Lord, you'd make your presence known. Lord, you're able to heal. You're able to deliver. You're able to give grace and strength. Lord, we just pray, Father, that you would minister in an evident way. May people feel your spirit, Father God. Lord, for this purpose, Jesus, you came to give hope in hopeless situations. Lord, to shine your light where it's dark. God, I pray, Lord, tonight, God, every one of these needs, save these that are lost. Lord, you're able to save. You're able to make a way that they encounter you as Savior and Deliverer. God, heal these that are sick. Lord, these that are hurting from their loss. Lord, you're the God of all comfort. I pray that you would comfort them and strengthen them and empower them, Lord, tonight. Lord, we seek you. We ask you to move. We pray to you, Father. Hallelujah. You are the living God. You are the living God. You are the mighty God. You're the everlasting God. And we are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. Lord, we pray you'd minister, Lord. Hear our prayers. Jesus, we thank you. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. If you wanted to go ahead and get your scripture, we've been in 
in the Sermon on the Mount. We begin the second chapter of that sermon. We call this section Beyond the Beatitudes. We thought we was going to quit with the Beatitudes, and we move forward. And I just kind of, as I study, I keep reminding myself, and I think as you listen tonight, you could do as well, that these are Jesus' words. This is his sermon. And so he has something to say uh, to us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Remember the Young Married Couple Fellowship this Friday at 630. We're going to be looking at several verses here tonight, but I want to read just one to encapsulate uh, the theme this evening. That would be verse 5, and just the very first part of that verse. Jesus said, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Jesus didn't give titles to his message, but I, I tried to think, what would Jesus entitle this segment of his sermon? And, I, you know, I can't tell you for sure, but it might be something like this. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. That's what we're going to talk about. Let me ask you, how many churches do you really think would be comfortable having Jesus for revival? I mean, to be preaching a revival. I mean, just, just the, some of the things we've looked at. How many would, would welcome this sermon? Don't be a hypocrite. Amen. I started to have you say that to your neighbor, but I better not. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. I haven't ever just written these things down, but let me tell you something. There are some reoccurring things that are brought to me as pastor things of real concern to folks, and they bring these things to me. And one of the reoccurring things that I hear is this, Pastor, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a hypocrite. You may have never wrestled with that, but that's a real concern, and I hear it quite often. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you, let me in on a little secret here. Hypocrites aren't worried about being hypocrites. Think about that. So if you're worried whether you're a hypocrite or not, it's pretty evident that you're not. But I want to tell you, it's a healthy thing, I think, because that desire not to be a hypocrite is a good preventative for being one. I think God's people whose hearts have really been touched, they want to be sincere. They want to be genuine. Amen. Jesus deals with this subject of hypocrites by talking about three religious activities. We're going to look at those from his sermon tonight. He talks about almsgiving. We don't use that word much anymore, almsgiving. He talks about praying, and he talks about fasting. Now, some people we're going to see have taken what he says to kind of say, well, if that's true, let's quit giving alms, let's quit praying, and let's definitely quit fasting. And they use Jesus' words for an excuse to quit. But, but you see, these activities are right and good and spiritual. Jesus isn't attacking doing the activities. He's dealing with the motive by which we do these activities. Jesus never says, don't do these things. In fact, even as he's correcting the motive, he is encouraging folks to do these things. How do I know that? Well, if you have your Bibles open, you can look in verse 2. Jesus says, when thou doest thine alms. Not if, but when. And it's an expected thing of his people to give alms. When thou, in verse 5, he says, when. Not if you pray, or if you ever get around to it, but when you pray. And then in verse 16, he doesn't say, if you fast. He says, when you fast. So Jesus is not trying to get us not to do these activities. He's simply dealing with the wrong motive of doing them. You know, in the very first verse in this portion, Jesus shows us the motive of the hypocrite versus, we're going to see in another verse, the motive of someone that's genuine. Has anyone spotted it yet? Right there in verse 1 is the motive of the hypocrite. What is it? Does anyone see it? There it is. To be seen of them, which is men. To be seen of men. That is the motive of the hypocrite. 
to be seen of men. What is the motive of the genuine that is found in verse 4? That thy alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret. The motive of the genuine is that I'm only interested in the father. I'm focused on the father. It doesn't matter what men see or don't see, men think or don't think about my worship, my giving, my praying. I'm only concerned with the audience of the Father. You see, that's the question. Do you do these things, praying, worshiping, giving? Do you do them to be seen of people? Or you do those things knowing that you want them to be seen of God? That's the dividing line. Let me put it this way. We could put it this way. Whose attention are you trying to get? You ever heard that expression? They're just trying to get somebody's attention. You ever heard that? Hear it a lot. Whose attention am I trying to get? I'm a hypocrite if I'm trying to get men's attention. But I'm not a hypocrite if I'm simply trying to get God's attention. You know, that, that might be a question to, to ask tonight. Do you attract God's attention By the way you pray. Do you attract God's attention by the way you worship? When's the last time you've given in a way that's attracted God's attention? So let's look at these three things tonight and ask that question. Number one, whose attention are you trying to get when you give? Whose attention are you trying to get when you give? Let's look at verse 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Now, I'm I'm not going to deal with it right now. I'm going to mention it. Some people have used this about almsgiving as an excuse and reason not to tithe. We're going to see how they do that in a moment. But what I want you to see here is that, first of all, we must apply this to tithing, and we must apply this to giving in offerings. But that's not what an alms is. An alms is a compassionate gift to somebody with a need. It's like giving money to a beggar or somebody that's got a financial need or whatever. If you give to meet that need, a compassionate gift, that's what almsgiving is. Now, we can extrapolate, and we will, and we can apply this to all of our giving, our giving and offering and our tithing. But when folks try to use this as an excuse to not tithe, first of all, it's not even... First of all, talking about tithing. It's talking about compassionate giving. You know, that that little thing I just noted, and we'll look at it in a minute, where people use the words of Christ to try to justify not doing something. I shouldn't be surprised, but over and over I have found through the years that people are masters of taking the Scripture and finding a reason of something they don't want to do. Have you ever noticed that? They're masters at that. And once again, they have done that. Jesus never intended this scripture to be used an excuse not to give. He's talking about the right motive in giving. He's not even talking about the manner of giving. Do you put it in an offering plate? Do you put it in a box with a slot? Do you send it in? He's not talking about the manner of giving. He's talking about the motive of giving. Our motive should not be to be seen of men. That doesn't mean you can't give in public or shouldn't give in public. That means you're not giving because it's public. You're giving in public, but you're not giving because it's in public. You know, how do I know that? Because if you give an alm, the beggars that you gave alms to are in public. They're sitting on the side of the road. They're at the gate beautiful. And if you gave an alms to them, unless you went there, they're not going to be there at midnight. Unless you went there, when they're not there, there's going to be people everywhere. So it's an understood thing that people, it's in public, people's going to see you give. So Jesus isn't talking about not giving in public. He's talking about not giving because you're in public and you want the public to notice. Let me put it this way. It's not wrong to be seen given. It is wrong to give to be seen. It's not wrong to be seen given, giving. It's wrong to give to be seen. That's what Jesus is saying. Never forget, Jesus commended the widow that gave in the treasury. She gave in front of all, but she, she didn't give it away. Now, those rich men gave so they would know how much they were giving. But she gave in a way 
But it was still in public, and Jesus commended her public. If, you, if, you're, if you're wondering what I'm referring to, remember the le- widow that put in her two mites. Jesus commended her and said she's given more than you all. But she gave that in public, but her motive was right. That's what Jesus is after. Let's look at verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest on alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. Giving is supposed to be an act of worship. Giving is supposed to be something we do in devotion to God. We don't do it to draw attention. Can you imagine what these fellas were doing? They waited till there was a crowd in the marketplace. And here is a, here's a beggar that needed something. And so the Pharisee hired a trumpet player, probably paid more for the trumpet player than he did put in the cup for the beggar. And he had them to sound the trumpet. Da, 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 da. See, I needed a trumpet tonight. And then when everybody stopped, because oh, they heard the horn. You're not going to applaud? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, who was going to go ahead, Jerry? Pod for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you imagine they were actually doing that? I don't know, but you know, I, I have noticed. You know, I've been secretary of several different and treasurer of several different organizations and things where I counted offerings like at youth camps and stuff. It's amazing how folks fold the one. So the number of the denomination doesn't show when it's put in the offering plate. But if it's a (laughs) hundred, it's laid out on top. I think I'll just leave that next paragraph out. I may get in a lot of trouble there. Notice what Jesus says here. He says, as the hypocrites do. Now, how many knows what a hypocrite is? By the way, when you say the word hypocrite, that was never translated. That's the original word. They just put English letters to it. A hypocrite. A hypocrite is one that went under the mask. It's an actor. So a hypocrite is one who acts the part of someone he isn't. I know there's rare occasions in movies, if it's a biography, where somebody will act themselves. But almost in every case, an actor or actress is acting as somebody they're not. That's what a hypocrite is, someone who's acting what they're not. You see, that's the question in our worship. Is it an act or is it real? Never forget, actors never act except for an audience. That's the whole purpose. And that's the same with a hypocrite. A hypocrite is doing it For the audience. Notice what Jesus says here. If you give that way, verily I say to you, they have their reward. When that little fella dropped that in that beggar's cup, as I just enacted, that people looking at that and say, boy, that's a good man. Look what he gave. That's it. That was his reward for that act of giving. If he made it to heaven, he never got any reward for giving to that beggar. He already got his reward when people notice what he gave. I can't think of a concrete example, but I I, I remember sometimes, you know, just jokingly, but folks would brag about something they'd done in secret, and I'd say, ooh, you just lost your reward. They went and dug that jewel right out of your crown because they were getting their reward from the applause of men. And by the way, just a practical note here, that's why I've always been pretty reluctant about pledge giving i know there's purposes and reasons they do that but that puts people on a spot how many will give a hundred how many will give that puts people on a spot to give to be seen of men if you don't feel that way that's fine but just personally that's the way i feel look at verse three but when thou doest psalms let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth this is the part that people use as a reason not to tithe how do they do that let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth they say this if i were to pay my tithes that's ten percent then i would have to sit down 
and figure that. So if I made $500 this week, I'd have to figure that 10% is $50, and then I would know what I was given. And Jesus said, no, don't let your left hand know what your right hand do. Besides that, if I were to give tithes, there's a, there's a person that records that for income tax purposes. And if my name's on the check, they'll know how much I gave. And the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand do. I've always wondered about when they said that. I mean, think about it. Now, I'll have to make this up, believe me, but here they, in the, <laughs> believe me, I didn't know it was that bad. But <laughs> I'll have to make it up. But, uh, <laughs> oh, I don't believe in letting the left hand know what the right hand do. And so here in their walk, they got a $100 bill, $50 bill, $20 bill, 10, 5, 1. Are you going to tell me that when it comes time to put an offering plate, they do this number? <laughs> I don't want my left hand to know. You know they don't. And if they do, my, what are the odds that they never pick the 100 and 20 or 50? What is the odds they're always picking the 5 or the 1? They know exactly what they've put in that offering plate. Can you say Amen. You see, this was an expression of the day. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand do. It doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're giving. It means you do it inconspicuously. You don't do it to get attention. You're not trying to call attention. You're not saying, look, left hand, look what that right hand's doing. It's not an attention thing. It's, Jesus is saying, you know, you shouldn't be mulling over this. I wonder what people will think if I would give this amount. I wonder what my neighbor next to me will think when I drop in the check for $1,000. That's what he's addressing. You see, how much you give is a private matter. It is. I don't, as pastor, I don't know what you give. What you give is a private matter. Whether or not you give is not. You say, how can you say that, pastor? Because read the book. Giving offerings to God has always been a public activity. From the very beginning, read it. You bring to the tabernacle. You bring to the temple in the New Testament. You bring to that fellowship on the first day of the week. You bring. It was a public part of worship, the giving. Look at verse 4. That thy alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. I know some people say, well, we get to the place, we don't even think about reward. But in a sense, we can't. God built us to have ambition. God built us to do things that, that, that are beneficial. We are motivated by reward. There's nothing wrong with that. But our reward shouldn't be the reward of people's acclaim or the reward of folks thinking well of us or the reward of any of those things. Our reward should be to please the Father. Our reward should be the spiritual reward, the heaven reward, the holy reward, the benefit to our spiritual man. It isn't that we're trying to get God to notice us. It's not that. It means we give not so people will notice, but we give knowing that God always does notice. You know, we sing, my God keeps a record. How many knows God keeps a record? And notice what he says here. There'll be a day when you will be rewarded openly by God. Amen. A lot of folks do a lot of things that are never seen, but I tell you one day, amen, it's going to come out in heaven. And your reward's going to be heaven to all. And it may be come out down here. It just goes back to the proverb. Let another praise thee and not thy own mouth. And God rewards his faithful people. I, I believe this. I've said this many times, but when we get to heaven, you're going to be surprised. There's going to be some widows who are on a social security pension. And when we get to heaven, they're going to be rewarded for the way they gave to missions and to the church. And they're going to have a greater reward than some of these great big names who had tremendous ministries. It's going to be that way. I'm convinced. Secondly, the second thing Jesus deals with, whose attention are you seeking when you pray? Look at verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. Don't be a hypocrite. For they love to pray. You know, I, I just stop and I, I'm just amazed at that. That sounds like a good thing. Boy, I'll tell you what. 
That brother Brian, he loves to pray. That sounds good. Except they were doing it for the wrong reason. Did you know people can love spiritual things for the wrong Oh, I just love to sing in church. Why? <laughs> well, you don't want me for revival either. Amen. They love to pray. Standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets, here it is again, that they may be seen of me, and verily I say unto you, there have the reward. Now, once again, Jesus isn't speaking against praying. He's not talking about praying in public. He's not against that. He's talking about a people who make an exhibition out of their prayer. Prayers that are prayed to get the attention of other people. We need to pray. You know Jesus isn't discouraging that. Let's go on, verse 6, and we'll put those two together. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, once again, I can tell that these, you know, some people take this, you know, if you're going to pray, go in your closet, shut the door, to say we should ever pray in public. And we Pentecostals, we have concerts of prayer. We're all praying together. We pray in the altars and everything. And they say, oh, 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 no, we shouldn't do that. If you're going to pray, you need to get in your closet. But don't forget something. Jesus isn't t- talking against public praying because, number one, Jesus prayed in public. Right in front of the people. And he said, that was, he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said this. They had a lesson to learn about the Father, not about Him. It, wasn't, it was about the Father. Of course, Him, He was showing them the Father, but it was a public prayer. He encouraged public prayer. And not only that, we're going, to, we're, not, we're going to cover it tonight, but we'll cover it next Wednesday night, Lord willing. Jesus gave them a prayer to pray. Have you ever stopped and, think, and thought of the pronouns in the prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven. Forgive us our That's a public prayer. That's a prayer we should pray together. Our Father. And so Jesus isn't against public prayer. He's not against praying out loud. Jesus prayed out loud. And again, it boils down to this. He's about the motive to pray. Did you know you can pray in private and it still be public? I learned this my first week at Bible school. And I came second semester. And you... You don't get all the orientation and all that. And I said I was going to get up early and pray, you know, be real spiritual. And so I set my alarm and I got up. Nobody else was up. I looked for a place to pray. And I went to the stairwell. And I got under the stairwell. Well, you got to understand something. It's all concrete and steel. And I didn't think I was praying that loud. But, boy, a monitor caught me just like that. He said, you woke the whole upstairs up. What it did, that stairwell got a hold of my voice and just echoed it. And it's a block building. It just echoed I was praying privately, but it was still public. I didn't intend for it to be that way. That's the difference. So you can pray private, and you can pray in public, and it still be private. Because you're not trying to get folks' attention. There's a very private conversation between you and the Lord. But it is a wonderful, a wonderful, I shouldn't say convenient, it's a wonderful benefit to be able to have a private place to pray. Do you have a private place to pray? You know, I like this thing about shutting the door. There's a whole sermon there. If you're going to pray, you need to shut the door on some things. And it's not always a physical door you need to shut. Some thoughts you need to shut the door on, some emotions. You just need to shut the door. And by the way, just one other thing. You know, we, when we think of the closet here, and it's okay if you do, but we immediately think of a closed closet, but their, their houses weren't designed like ours. It, that could have been a pantry-like area. It, it just simply means find a place that you can devote to prayer that you're not going to be bothered and distracted. How many knows where the closet usually was in Bible times? This is real interesting. Where did they find a closet? On the roof. Peter found that closet when he was there uh, remember that? When he went up on the rooftop, he went up there to get alone. Do you have a place to get alone? I've told you before of, of um, Charles, not Charles Wesley. Of course, Charles, yes, it was his mother too, but John Wesley's mother, Susanna Wesley. There I'm looking for Susanna. She took her apron in a busy house and put it over her head, and that was her prayer closet. Amen. I don't know where yours, are, yours is, 
But it's a good thing to have a place to pray. And did you know even in church, you can find a closet? This altar is a good closet of prayer. Maybe it's the pew. Find a p- private place. And pray, and this is the whole key here, pray to thy Father which is in secret. You see, public or private, it's a matter of who you are considering your audience. That's what makes it private. You're not caring what people think. God, the Father, is your audience. If you're only praying in public, then you are probably praying simply because of the social pressure and because people do hear you pray. But the folk that, is, that are genuine, they don't only pray in church, they pray in private. Because their audience is the Father, whether it's at church or whether at home. How many is, you know, one thing I've learned, folks pick up on things. And this is, this is a hard trap for those that are involved in public speaking and, and leading service. How many can always tell when somebody is praying a public prayer for the and, and there are there are those in the scripture you pray it for the benefit of the people. How many can always tell when they switch from talking to God to the talking to the people? <laughs> they forgot a point in their sermon, so they work it in their prayer. But they're really not talking to God, they're talking to the, how many can tell that? You can tell when someone quits talking to God and starts talking to the people. No, the Father is to be at the audience of our prayer and our praying. Make no mistake, there's public prayer that benefits folks. It's all through Scripture. Verse 7, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now the emphasis here is vain repetition. Here's another Scripture that's misunderstood. I've heard folks say, you should never repeat anything when you pray. If you do, you lack faith. Did you know they were actually teaching that and using this as a Scripture? If you ask God to heal somebody... And you ask him the second time, you lack faith. Because the Bible says don't have vain repetition. Well, I always like to remind those folks that Jesus prayed the same thing. How many remembers that in the garden? It said he prayed that prayer, went to the disciples, and he came back. And the scripture said he prayed the same words. So it's not praying the same thing. It's not even repeating yourself in prayer. It's this thing about vain. In other words, our prayers should not be mindless blathering. We should be engaged. Our minds should be engaged. Our hearts should be engaged. We're just not saying ritualistic words. Prayer is not just a cathartic exercise. If I had time, and I don't, and I won't, but I, I, I'm just... I'm just so alarmed at how we're bringing Eastern religion things into Christianity and, 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 and things from yoga and everything else, this Easter meditation. That's really what Jesus is talking about, where you get your little mantra, you get your little word, and you kind of zone out and you try to focus on nothing. Um, 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 um. Put a word there, you know, uh, holy, holy. You're not really trying to connect. You're not trying to engage. You're not. You're simply trying to numb or whatever, zone out by saying. And, and, and another thing about this vain repetition is saying things as a ritual. You've done something wrong. What you need to do is go say ten Hail Marys. That'll take care of it. That's pointless, vain repetition. No. But I'm telling you, if you get down to business with God and your heart is burdened, you're seeking God, you may find yourself saying the same thing over and over. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. But it's not mindless blathering. You're engaged. Your your mind is set on the Father. You're you're looking to Him. Verse 8, Be not therefore likened to them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask Him. They weren't praying the same thing over and over because they were fervent. They meant they were praying over and over because they say it doesn't matter. God's not hearing anyways. Amen. Your father already knows what you have need of. Did you know you when we pray, we never inform God of anything? Oh, God, you wouldn't believe how terrible a day I'm having. God said, no, tell me. You can't inform. Then why does God want us to ask? He already knows. Because of what an asking does to us. Did you know when we ask God, we acknowledge our need? 
Do you know a lot of us can get help even tonight if we just truly acknowledge our need to God? That's what asking us. We acknowledge our need. But you know, here, oh, I wish I had time. Another great thing happens when you pray. You acknowledge your relationship. Why are you praying to God? Because He's your Father. You have a relationship with Him. Our Father, which art in heaven. We pray because it humbles our hearts to ask. I don't know how you are, but to ask for help, I have to humble myself. Oh, we don't have time for it. Let's go on. Last of all, whose attention do you seek when you fast? Moreover, when you fast, be not, here it is again, don't be a hypocrite of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces. They may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. Some reason I told this lately, but we had a guy at OBI. Back in those days, we, they fixed the meals in the cafeteria, and everybody went to the meals except those that were fasting. But we had this guy, and we sat in tables of four, and I still remember so just succinctly. One day, we're sitting there, three of us. We got our plates. We sit down. Here comes a guy in with no plate, and he sits down, watches us eat. Why aren't you eating? Are you sick? No, I'm not sick. Why aren't you eating? What? Go get a truck. No, no. Why aren't you eating? I'm fasting. What are you doing in the cafeteria? Why aren't you in the chapel? Whose attention was he trying to get? Maybe he's trying to make it harder on himself. I don't know. Fasting basically is going without food, but there's a little more to that, and I know I'm making this simplistic, but fasting is going without food for the purpose of seeking God. But it was usually done at times of great sorrow and grief. And loss and pain, people fasted. That's why Jesus said they disfigure their faces and they have a sad countenance. I don't have time to talk about fasting, but just real briefly, let me insert this. We can fast, I believe, more than just food. Because in the end, fasting is putting aside something to seek the Lord. And it usually is food, but how many knows we could put away some other things to seek the Lord? Have you ever done that? God will bless you for that. Amen. You see, we're living in a time when folks don't want to give up anything to serve God, to get closer to God. If it comes between church and ball, they'll choose ball. They don't want to give anything up to seek the Lord. So don't do that. Don't make a show of your fasting. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. Now, I said fasting can be given up things other than food. But one thing, even Jesus is clear here, don't give up bathing. Come on, that was, that was some solid teaching there. He said, when, when thou fastest, anoint thy head. And what's he trying to say here? Wash your face. Go on as if it's a normal day not to call attention. Keep bathing, keep shaving, keep combing your hair, keep brushing your teeth. So people don't get this idea that you're wanting them to notice something about what you're doing. You know, I promise you, I don't know if anybody in this room has done this. I don't know that, okay? So if you have, I don't see your face before me, okay? But that's another thing I don't quite understand. It may be a good thing to give up social media for a while probably a good thing for all of us but if you're going to give up social media why do you go on that social media site and write an essay about why you're not going to be on that social site for a while go wash your face last of all verse 18 that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You know, we can find God in the place where no one's looking but God. Isn't that, isn't that encouraging? We can find God in the place where no one's looking but God. It's not for men. Fasting isn't for men. But make sure of one thing. No one else may ever know, but God knows. I didn't even give Brother Mike these scriptures, but think of these scriptures. Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of whom we have to do. And then 
Same book. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward His name, in that you have ministered to the saints, and you do minister. God never forgets. He sees it all. Even God is going to reward every genuine, spiritual, God-directed activity. You've never given one cent, amen, sincerely to God, that God will not reward one day. You've never prayed one prayer sincerely that's fallen to the ground. You've never cried out to God one time with a genuineness of heart that He did not hear. You've never made an effort to draw close to God that He did not take notice of. Amen. I want to tell you, we're not seeking. We're not hypocrites. We're not doing it for others. But sometimes we get to feeling just because nobody else notices that God hasn't noticed. I want you to know God has seen. He sees it all. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad for it tonight? Go ahead and come, music, and I'll quit. I mean, I told you at the beginning of this that constantly people come to me and say, I, I just don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm afraid. I'm a hypocrite. And sometimes they don't come to church. And sometimes they don't come to the altar. And sometimes they don't worship. And I say, what's wrong? Why didn't you come to church? Why didn't you worship? Why didn't you come to the altar? And they say, because I've messed up. I've done something wrong. And I, I, I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I immediately say, you got that wrong. Being a hypocrite is messing up, but coming to church and lifting your hands and shouting out and, and coming to the altar and dancing around and, and to give people the impression that everything's right with you and everything's good with you and, and you're where you ought to be with God. I said, now that is a hypocrite. But if you've messed up, even coming to church, reaching up your hands and saying, oh God, help me, and worshiping and singing and coming to the altar and digging, that's not being a hypocrite. That's just seeking help from the Father. It all depends on whose attention you're trying to get. And I don't know how you feel, but I need God's attention about some things. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. I'm not opening another sermon, and it's not connected to the main theme. But let me tell you this one little thing, and I'm done. Remember this about going in your closet and shutting the door? My second year, I was Bible school. I was in the upstairs. That's the, back then, it was the upper class that's where they put them. And uh, trying to find a way from out from all that activity that can happen in the boys' dorm, I started getting in the closet after lunch to pray. And the only one that knew it was my best friend that lived downstairs. And several weeks later, he noticed. That was at the beginning of the year, but you know how things happen. You begin to collect things, you know, things from home. and You make trips and Several weeks later, I've never told this myself. He always tells it on me. But several weeks it went by, and he noticed at that time that I wasn't upstairs in my room. He said, hey, Cliff, how come, how, how, how come you haven't been in your closet? Huh? I, I wasn't even thinking. I just answered literally and truthfully. I said, because there's so much stuff in it now, I can't get in there. I got to thinking about that since he, he preached it this way. But he was right. He preached it this way. Has your closet got so full you can't get in it to seek God? Has your schedule got so full? Has your extracurricular activities got so many that you can't get in the closet and seek God? If your closet's that full, it's too full. <laughs> Amen. How I many know sometimes we need to clean out that closet and find a place to get in there? And shut the door. Oh, aren't you glad we have a God? Oh, I want to tell you why it's not vain repetition. Because there is a God in heaven. Let me tell you why it's not vain repetition. His ear is open to the cry of the righteous. Would you stand tonight? Amen. Amen. Would you, would you find a closet to pray in? Amen. Around the altar, in your pews, up in the choir loft. Amen. Would you find a closet? Let's seek the Lord tonight. Amen. We've got a few minutes here to say, I want to talk to you, Father. And I want to tell you, as you come and pray, come believing this. The Father sees. I said, the Father sees. The Father sees. Hallelujah. The Father hears. The Father hears. I know we're at church. I know you may hear the sound next to you. But we're not talking to each other. Amen. We're talking to the Father. Would you talk to the Father tonight? Hallelujah.